kia ora everyone, my name is Sally and welcome to this session with Sue Corkle for the support person's talk on what lies ahead coping with uncertainty. So before I introduce Sue, just a reminder that there's a Q&A button along the bottom of your screen. So you might need to just hover your mouse or your finger over um, for it to appear. Then you can click on that and type questions. If we've got time at the end of Sue's session, we will be able to read those questions and get Sue's answers. So it's now my pleasure to introduce Sue Corkle. She graduated with a Diploma of Professional Counselling in June 2018. She gained a postgraduate diploma in cognitive behavioural therapy from Massey University in 2009. Sue has always had a great interest in supporting cancer patients, their families and friends, and helping make a difference. She has had over 30 years as an oncology nurse, working in a variety of hospital and community settings, including Wellington Haematology and Oncology Centre, the Cancer Society and the Child Cancer Foundation. For the last three years, she's been working as a counsellor at St George's Cancer Care Centre in Christchurch, where she works with a team offering support to those with cancer and their family whānau. So as a provisional member registered with New Zealand Association of Counsellors. So it is my great pleasure to welcome and hand over to Sue Corkle. Thank you. Over to you, Sue. Tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you for the introduction, Sally. It's a great privilege to be able to talk to you today, even if it does feel very odd presenting virtually. My topic today is what lies ahead coping with uncertainty. And of course, it's become even more topical as we all cope with COVID and its lockdowns. It's no secret that being a family support person or carer of someone with cancer is challenging. You know it's both rewarding and hard. It's full of fearful situations, and yet it can also be full of unexpected, warming and heartening events. We know that there are many benefits in being in this important role, and I hope you are all proud of what you're doing. Some of you will, be, will have been supporting someone for many years, and others of you may only be just beginning. You may be coping with the acute phases of a bone marrow transplant or a maintenance therapy or at the end of treatment. And whether you're coping with leukemia, lymphoma, multiple myeloma or any other blood cancer, the unique challenges you face can be ongoing and immense. An important facet of that psychological toll is due to uncertainty. In my presentation today, a family carer or support person will include anyone who takes the primary role in supporting someone who has a blood cancer, whether that be a spouse, partner, adult family member or friend. I've drawn on as much recent research around blood cancers as much as possible, but as there is not a great deal written around caregiving and support for those with blood cancers, I've included some research addressing that for people caring with someone who has any type of cancer. Oops. So today I'm going to talk briefly around what uncertainty is, the research that shows the sources of uncertainty for family support carers, what the effects are and what you can do that helps. Uncertainty occurs when details of situations are ambiguous, complex or unpredictable, when information is unavailable or inconsistent, and when people feel insecure in their own state of knowledge or the state of knowledge in general. We live in uncertain times. Uncertainty is not new, but the degree that you may have to cope with it is more than most. Research that came out this year suggesting that COVID will only increase the caregiving challenges for those coping with a blood cancer won't come as any surprise. So where does uncertainty fit in? Well, as you will be aware, it occurs at almost every step of the way. I've divided it broadly into four concepts. 
certainty as it is uncertainty as it's related to the roles and skills of being a support person, to self-care, to medical uncertainty, and to COVID-19. Uncertainty related to the role and skills required of being a support person. You tend to get thrust into the role of caregiving, often with little or no preparation or understanding of what will be involved. I'm sure none of you knew what a journey you were beginning, the amount of medical jargon you'd need to understand and all the skills that you would need. It's a huge task to get you to understand all the blood results, do dressings, and kind of be the ears and eyes at home for picking up any sign that things aren't going well and that you need to take action on. In 2008, Dr. Mitch Gollant and his team at the Wellness Community Center in Washington, DC, conducted a survey of over 500 carers looking after someone with cancer in the United States of America. And they found that their carers' roles were extensive. And as you can see here, 98% provided emotional support, 96% went with their loved one to medical appointments, 82% helped with decision-making, 79% coordinated medical care, 80% provided transportation, and 74% helped manage finances. These quotes highlight some of the uncertainty felt. It scared me how much the responsibility was on me, and if I did something wrong, would I hurt him? Every step of it seemed so dire because mistakes could lead to an infection. Here is, sorry, research shows us that stress that carers can feel is not necessarily linked to the hours engaged in supporting someone or the severity of the patient's symptoms, but is more influenced by the lack of confidence and inadequate preparation to perform the skills expected of them, along with the disruption to your usual lifestyle, your work, and all those things that you normally do socially. Medium age diagnosis, sorry, actually, I just think we just must. A medium age diagnosis for the most common types of blood cancer, leukemia and non Hodgkin's lymphoma, is 67 years of age. Therefore, the responsibility of caregiving often can fall to one of the children. Midlife adult child caregivers particularly report significant burden and stress trying to juggle multiple roles. Their own family demands, work demands, their own personal health, as well as caring for a parent. Partners also experience ever-changing demands, changes in roles and responsibilities. Often carers feel that they need to be the strong one. They need to support their loved one, the wider family and friends. And some people can feel duty bound to care and that asking for help is only creating burden for others. This can lead to a real belittling of your own needs as the emotional uncertainty of what might happen if you do speak out and express what you want for yourself is too uncomfortable to confront. They feel they need to be there and they are the only ones who can do this. This can frequently involve putting health issues second, not attending your own primary care appointments, taking medications on schedule, putting off going to the dentist, etc. It can be hard to commit to walks, exercise classes, hobby classes, or anything that you normally engage in if you're too tired or worried all the time about how the person you're caring for will manage when you're not there or they might have said they don't like you going out and leaving them. This quote here, sometimes I feel as though my whole life revolves around his illness and I don't matter except to take care of him. Can be resonate, may resonate with many. 
when we come to uncertainty related to medical treatment. Multiple studies have identified that committed caregivers often have higher levels of distress than does the person with a blood cancer. And why? Because you're doing it all. You're the glue. You're the one they rely on. So not only do you have to understand everything, but often you have to be the translator and the decision maker. It can feel an immense responsibility to have to be relied on to detect changes that need attention and often quickly. It's like riding on a roller, case, roller coaster in the dark, waiting and not knowing. This is just driving us insane because there's no way to plan. You can't plan for tomorrow, let alone, oh, sorry, misspelled there, next month. This has driven me absolutely crazy. And then we come to COVID. The lockdowns and uncertainty we've had to contend with has really highlighted to people generally how hard it is, how vulnerable you can feel, how isolating it can feel. And even when we're out of lockdowns, it can still seem very safe, unsafe out there, especially when someone you love is vulnerable. Obviously, a distressing concern for many family support carers is the inability to meet face-to-face -face with health professionals or not being able to attend hospital visits in the same way. Clinicians may become more dependent on you to do more complex care at home. Telehealth video calls or phone calls have worked extremely well for many and have created a real sense of assur assurance, but it can bring additional challenges. My mother had no idea how to video conference for her appointment. As a result, it was missed and rescheduled. This was terrible because she had symptoms and pain. I am very concerned that if I get exposed, I will not be able to care for my mom and if there is no one else, and there is no one else to help her. My biggest fear is that I would bring something home to her. I am extremely careful about her exposure to people and stuff from the outside. The only place I have taken her to is her doctors. I disinfect anything that comes into our home that will be touched or used by her and also me. On the other hand, it has also clearly shown us how many positives that we can do to keep in balance. It's not all doom and gloom. Many of you will be coping and doing well, but I'm sure you're also aware of times when it's definitely harder. So it's no surprise then that uncertainty results in many difficult emotions and stress. You've all been delivered curveballs and there are times when I'm sure that you feel some of these things. We know that 40% of people caring for someone with cancer get anxiety, stress and tension. You feel overwhelmed, find it hard to concentrate, become consumed by what-ifs, fear and distress, and feeling resentful towards others or being unreasonably annoyed by them. 39% of people have depression. You can have sleepless nights. You may resort to alcohol, tobacco or drugs to help cope. You may not eat as well as normally and, and not exercise. And it can be hard losing contact with friends. You can often feel quite lonely. And you may start avoiding activities or situations that bring on anxious feelings or thoughts. So that's a pretty long and depressing list of symptoms and behaviours. But knowing that uncertainty is at the root of a lot of these feelings, emotions and thoughts can make a difference in how you cope and where you focus your attention. So what does help? Research shows us that information is key. Information is empowering and information is important in gaining confidence in your role as a carer. 
and allied to information is the ability to then be a valuable advocate for the one you love, to help their voice be heard. And knowing can also help you to seek support from others if you don't understand something or feel some action needs to be taken. There are many excellent resources and I encourage you to use them if you aren't already. Obviously, I'm no expert, but looking online, I could see that you're extremely well served by Leukemia and Blood Foundation and their excellent support coordinators who are there to help you in whatever way they can. And I'm sure you're very familiar with all their booklets and newsletters, their education and support programs. They run webinars and support groups and information for children and grandchildren. Other reputable professional equivalent websites such as uh, Leukemia and Lymphoma, Lymphoma Network New Zealand, Multiple Myeloma New Zealand, also offer wonderful information that include e-learning modules for carers and video support. There is then, of course, all the support and information you can get from Contact with Cancer Society New Zealand and their weekly coping with cancer uh, webinar that they run every second Wednesday. There's the Frankly Speaking About Cancer series that comes from the United States, which has a wonderful array of podcasts, videos, and virtual learning. And the various hospices throughout New Zealand also run great support for carers. Here in Christchurch, we have the Korowai program. So at each step along the way, you may need to reach out for more information and support. Secondly, then, we have keeping connected with others and good communication. It's vital to keep your social connections going, whether you visit, call, do things together, engage in Facebook groups, whatever. Learn good communication strategies. Sometimes we don't always know how to say things in the best way in the situations we find ourselves in. You may not always be on the same page. Not all families find talking easy. Often people have different communication styles. You might be in a situation where your wife, for instance, wants to talk about how she's coping with her cancer openly, but you as her carer may prefer very limited discussion. When uncertainty is part of the picture, this may lead to irritation, anger, and feelings being hidden from each other, which add to the distress. Sometimes learning different ways to communicate can make a real difference. And this is where counseling may help. It may also be helpful to join a support group for carers, either physically or online. And I'm sure your support coordinators can help you with that. Other resources that I found, just a couple here, a communication guide for caregivers and Leukemia and Lymphoma Society have a wonderful caregiving workbook with a chapter on communication. And of course, we've all learned to Zoom or FaceTime. We've learned a lot with lockdowns and it's been awesome how the virtual world has opened up communication and connection. This quote here, we're talking about our emotions more often and more openly. And another one, we actually communicate a bit more as a family, trying to use video tools to stay close. And then we come to mental well-being. We all hate struggling with emotional pain. Most of us want to just try and avoid it. But what we experience is normal. It is simply our brain trying to keep us safe. When the future is uncertain and complicated and fears and worries are very real, it is normal to desperately want to ease or avoid that emotional pain. But as you know, it's much harder said than done. We know we can control our physical actions. You can decide exactly how you want to move and what to do. 
But the mistake we commonly make is believing that we can apply the same tactics to our thinking and that we can control our thoughts and our thinking. And we often try very hard to do this and we use a lot of energy in the process. But usually long term, this isn't effective. Our brain is designed to produce constant thoughts. It is completely normal to have these thoughts coming into your head all the time. It doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with you, but it's maybe helpful to understand why this happens. We all have a primitive brain called the amygdala in the center of our brain, that little green almond shaped thing. And it's basically similar to what it was 250,000 years ago when cavemen lived. And it functions just like a smoke alarm for our body. It's constantly trying to protect us from anything that it considers dangerous or compromises our safety. When it does something, it is then responsible for the fight and flight response, which many of you will be familiar with, when adrenaline and other neurochemicals and hormones surge through your body and help you to run like hell or stand and fight. And in the case of the caveman, it was to save him from being eaten by those dangerous saber-toothed tigers or woolly mammoths. Life was dangerous, and so our caveman learned to be really good at predicting, spotting, or avoiding dangerous things. So after such a frightening event, such as when he'd managed to fight off the tiger, he would go over and over again in his head what had happened to try and learn from it and protect himself for the next time. Safety and how to survive came first. We basically still have this primitive brain functioning as it did all those years ago. So when we're faced with situations that are full of uncertainty, seem dangerous or unsafe, our primitive brain wants us to worry and go over and over things in an effort to protect ourselves. But is it helpful? Often it isn't. Often there isn't anything to learn or we already know it and all it results in is an awful waste of lost mental energy. Uncertainty appears pretty unsafe to our amygdala and it bombards our frontal brain, which it can become a bit like a drained battery. ACT therapy is part of the third, the newer third wave therapies that are increasingly being used in psychological support. It has the emphasis on what we call psychological flexibility, on helping people to acknowledge their thoughts, but to let them come and go and not rigidly hold on to them, but rather just to accept that thoughts, feelings and sensations are there, they come and they go, and you have the choice as to whether you engage with them or not. So you let go that struggle with control being open, being present, and doing what matters to you is at the heart of this therapy. I find it particularly useful for coping with uncertainty, and I suggest this as something that may be useful for you to add to your toolkit of strategies. A metaphor that I like to use to describe how people may feel when coping with anxiety and fears is like you're standing on one side of a deep ravine. The side you're on is the side that's your new normal now. The other side where the anxiety monster is, is where you want to be. It's, it's your old normal, which was where you were before all this started. I can't wait to get back to being normal, is a frequent remark I hear. But the more energy you put into trying to get yourself there, the harder it becomes, the greater the gap, the greater the pain. It always involves loss of some sort, whether it be security, trust, safety, freedom, anything we care deeply about. So imagine that you're standing on one side of this ravine in a tug of war with the anxiety monster, and you're pulling as hard as you can, and then he pulls as hard as he can. 
You can keep doing this, but it's exhausting, all this pulling to and fro. So the solution? Well, you don't want to fall into the ravine, to the great depths below. So the easiest thing is to drop the rope and thereby stop the struggle. So in act, this means rather than getting lost in your thoughts, predicting and fearing the worst, you simply choose not to engage with your thoughts. It's not avoidance and it's not suppression. You know your thoughts won't go away and you can choose to hook into them at any stage you want, but you can consciously decide to let them come and go in their own time without you trying to control them. The focus and act is letting thoughts come and go and then coming back to be fully present in the moment and doing something of value. So to give you a taste of this right now, if you're willing, I'll guide you into a very simple grounding exercise called Notice, Name and Neutralize. This exercise involves acknowledging your thoughts or feelings, connecting with your body, and E, engaging in the present fully. So if you're willing, um, I'm going to just do this quite quickly uh, because of our time restraints. But normally you could take about 10 minutes to do this if you wanted, but you can do it in much shorter time if you wish. So just where you're sitting and if you're willing to give it a go, maybe just lower or soften your vision or perhaps close your eyes because you don't need to look at the screen. And just take a moment just to think about some aspect of uncertainty that you may have found a little difficult perhaps in the last few weeks. Any thoughts, feelings, emotions, memories, sensations or urges. And I suggest that you don't make it too distressing for the purposes of this exercise right now because it's very unnatural what we're doing. But what I'd like you to do is to see if you can just name what you're thinking or feeling. That might be something along the lines of when is everybody going to get vaccinated or how am I going to manage the next shop to the supermarket or how tired you are or how sick of being isolated you are. Whatever it is, just see if you can catch your thoughts and if you can, group them and give them a label. So you can either put them into a box or put them behind a door in your head and just put a name on that, like COVID worries or shopping, whatever. And then I want you to say to yourself, I notice that I'm thinking about and then whatever that label is that you've put on the box or the door. I notice that I'm thinking about COVID. I notice that I'm thinking about my partner's treatment. And now I want you to come into and connect with your physical body. So to do that, I want you just to push your feet into the floor. Slowly straighten your back and spine. Perhaps just press your fingers together. Stretch your arms out, shrug your shoulders, move your neck, and just gently breathe in and out. Note that you're not trying to turn away from or escape, avoid, or distract yourself from what is happening in your inner world. The aim is to be very aware of your thoughts and feelings, to know that they're there, but at the same time, connect with your body and actively move it. And why? So that you can gain some distance from your thoughts and feelings and at the same time gain as much control over your physical actions. So I'd like you to get a sense of where you are and engage in your senses. Look around the room and notice five things that you can see. And you Really look at them as if you've never seen them before, a bit like a curious scientist. Noticing color, shape, movement, texture. As I sit here, I can look at the computer, my desk, the curtains, the garden outside. 
just whatever you can see. And then I want you to listen to three to four things that you can hear. Giving each of them one by one your full attention. So you can hear my voice. I can hear the faint noise of a car outside, the cat purring, the hum of my computer. And notice three to four things that you can feel. Your feet on the floor. Maybe you can feel the texture of your socks on your feet. Feel your bottom sitting on the chair. Your hands on your lap. Air coming in and out of your nostrils. Just be aware of what you can feel. And then lastly, notice what you can smell and taste. So as you're sitting here and just taking a couple of breaths, and really focusing on your body and your senses, you can be aware of your thoughts, but at the same time, you can move your body. You can see, hear, feel, taste, and smell. And so gently bring yourself back to the present and reconnect with the computer screen. So this is an exercise you can do many times to gently bring yourself to the present, to acknowledge that your thoughts are there, but you can drop the struggle with them. Your thoughts won't go away, but neither will you have to use all that energy to keep struggling with them. I encourage you to practice this exercise if you like it. It is a skill just like all these other things to learn. And it's not learned straight away. I will uh, give Sally some resources at the end, including the notes for that exercise if you're interested. And then there's other self-care strategies. This beautiful diagram of Tafari Tapafa shows us so clearly that to be as resilient as possible to cope with uncertainty, we need to embrace holistic self-care. So that involves looking after ourselves physically, spiritually, socially, and mentally in balanced ways so that we can be like this body, strong and secure. Keeping yourself as resilient as possible helps enormously to cope with uncertainty. So what can you do to keep your cup as full as possible? Just some suggestions. Learn to say yes when people offer help in a worthwhile way. It's great to be very specific. You know, I'd love you to mow the lawn for me. Make a list of everyone who may be able to help you out and make a list of things that can be done by other people, like running errands. Don't be a martyr. Others may not do it as well as you do. But often they are willing. And remember that you had, to rem you had to learn how to do things. Learn to say no when you need a break and actively plan breaks. Laugh and sing. It's impossible to be anxious when you do both these things. Engage your spiritual self, whether that's through prayer and faith or simply whatever gives you peace and connectedness and purpose. Being in nature, enjoying a sunset, whatever resonates with your wairua. Enjoy the outdoors, exercise and nature. Celebrate the little things and give yourself permission to be kind to yourself. Hearing is hard work for most no matter how loving the relationship. We know that there can be many positives in caring, that often people are brought closer together and live life in a way that is deeply fulfilling and loving. But given the complexities of treatments and the involvement expected from caregivers and support people, and the distress at seeing someone you love having to go through so much, the emotional pain 
can be tough. Research shows us that uncertainty plays a significant role and comes with a high toll for family carers. But we also know that you can do things that make a real difference to how you cope with uncertainty. Information, staying connected, having good communication skills, and learning good mental strategies all help to lessen this toll. Practice good self-care and keep your bucket full all helps to build resilience. Life is a choice. Anxiety is not a choice. Either way you go, you will have problems and pain. So your choice here is not about whether or not to have anxiety. Your choice is whether or not to live a meaningful life. That quote is by Stephen Hayes, who is the founder of ACT. And that is the end. That's absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much, Sue. Um, wonderful presentation. We've got time for um, a couple of questions, if that's all right with you. Yeah. Do I stop sharing now? Yep, you can stop sharing. Right, so we have got first question. Um, I deal with uncertainty by understanding the worst case scenario, being prepared for it, and then usually being grateful when the actual outcome is relatively positive. Can you describe the sorts of physical confrontational situations a support person might have to deal with, e.g. vomiting, incontinence, hair loss, hard to manage pain, etc.? My wife has CLL. Most of the material and YouTube clips seem to only cover positive CLL journeys. So I think they're commenting more on their approach um, around imagining, understanding worst case scenario um, as sort of a, a coping strategy. Yeah. And so I guess what I would say there is that thinking ahead and trying to get the answers for everything can be really distressing. And you often can tie yourself into knots trying to work out all the things you might need to prepare for and do. And so coming back to just having general information about side effects, but then also then, I guess, tapping into knowing what you know and how you can respond right in the moment. So it's again kind of just dropping that struggle with all the what if that happens and what if that happens and what will I do? That's what makes it so incredibly stressful. I'm sure you've found to date that every time something's gone wrong, you have done your best and you know that you can call the medical staff or whatever. And it's probably worked out in a completely different way to what you might have thought that might have gone. So I guess what I'm saying there is that's a classic example really of trying to drop that struggle with the what ifs. That's lovely. Thanks, So, Next question I have here. Um, my partner has cancer. I feel I can't tell them how hard I am finding things. Likewise, telling friends seems hard. After all, I'm not the one with cancer. Any comments or tips? Uh, that's a very commonly expressed concern. And what we, the, with the clients I see a lot, we do a lot of work around that because actually, you're in this with your, your partner. And so really, you can't hide things from them. Usually they do know. And what is happening when you're not sharing is that you're simply building up a sort of elephant in the room, if you like. So um, if it's hard, then I would suggest you try and get some support to help you work through it. Um, but we do know that if you can share, and express how you're feeling. Actually, you're in this together and you work together as a team. And often it's not as bad as you think. That's wonderful, thank you. I think that's the end of our questions. Um, and thank we're actually coming to the end of our time. So just thank you again, Sue, for that wonderful insight into uncertainty that I know we can all identify with, those practical strategies and suggestions um, just, just fantastic. So 
Thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your wisdom and your time. Um, and yeah, just thank you. <laughs>